Oh, I can do 68 mile an hour. <laughs> but uh, and I, I'm usually really fast up here, so I auto about 2,200 RPMs. So I'll, I'll just try to calm down. Uh, I'll try not to cry today, but I'm not promising you. You know, years ago, my wife would get up here and sing, and she would just bawl. And then I was like, calm, cool, and collected. Then Richard said, you need to move to Chicago. We'll toughen you up. Well, she quit crying, and I started crying. <laughs> but as you get older, you... That's a possibility. <laughs> nah, just joking. But I do appreciate the Brian Bible Church of Louisville, the saints there to support this ministry, uh, the Columbus Bible Church uh, for supporting this ministry, Miami Valley uh, Bible Church. They was well representative here. I was, I was joking with Matt a little bit. I said, Matt, are they having a board meeting here? I said, are they, they going to have a vote of confidence on you guys? And just, just joking a little bit. And, and our dispensational Bible church, uh, our local church in the Canton Maslin area. Uh, and we thank each and what, every one of you guys for being here. Like David mentioned last night, if it wasn't for you here, who would be preached to? I mean, we could get together and have a, a, uh, a boating, uh, uh, go down the Mississippi River on a uh, paddle boat. A bunch of preachers can. But it's good to have you here. And I do thank each of men that are here that preach this weekend. It's been a glorious weekend and their families. I'll salute you all. As Brother uh, uh, Ted mentioned, it is uh, tomorrow's Memorial Day. And uh, you got to remember the one who died for you. That's the key. And uh, as Brother said, we are soldiers. And when you listen to the gospel, that woke you up. You're in a ready state to serve. And you're in a ready state to battle. And until you leave that, uh, hear that last trump, you haven't heard taps yet. Your reveille is sounded, and you're at the battlefield. And I appreciate what Brother Kyle mentioned last night. But these meetings are very, very important. And our conference verse, having confidence in, be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, having confidence in uh, thy obedience I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. That part alone, if you think about it, Paul is saying, you're going to do more than what I say. And what did he do? He wrote 13 books. More than any other person in the Bible, he writes 13 books for us marching orders. Okay? But, uh, I got a little joke here. T uh, Richard uh, yesterday mentioned about grandchildren. Have you heard the one about how man earned longevity? Well, God created the donkey and told him, you will work tirelessly from sun up to sun down, carrying heavy bags on your back. You will eat grass and you will have, not have intelligence and you will live 50 years. You will be a donkey. And the donkey said, I'm a donkey. Living 50 years is, is too much. Give me 20 years. And God gave him 20 years. Then God created a dog and told him, you will look at, after a man's house. You will be the man's best friend. You will eat whatever you, they give you, and you will live 25 years. You will be a dog. The dog answered God, living 25 years is, is too much. Give me only 10. God gave him 10. Then God created a monkey. And told him, you will jump from branch to branch. You will do silly things. You will, be, you will be amusing. And you will live 20 years. The monkey answered, God, living 20 years is too much. Give me 10. God gave him 10. God, God agreed. Finally, God created man. And told him, you will be a man. The only rational being on this earth. And you will use your intelligence to control other animals. And you will dominate the world. And you will live 20 years. The man answered, God. I'm a man, but living 20 years is not enough. Why don't you give me the 30, you, you refused the donkey, or donkey refused, the 20 the dog didn't want, and the 10 the monkey refused. That's what God did. Since, man, since then, man lived 20 years like a man. Then he entered adulthood and spent 30 years like a donkey, working and carrying the load on his back, and then when, when his children leave, home, he spends 15 years like a dog looking after the house and eating whatever's given to him. 
Then he gets into retirement and spends 10 years like a monkey, jumping from house to house or from children to children doing silly things to amuse their grandchildren. <laughs> so, so anyway, you know we don't act like that. You, you do. But the thing is, we, got, we were left on this earth to do a work. And my message title today is, is what is a church to do? And not only a church of assembly, we found out through Matt, it's individual, it's family. And, uh, and this is something very dear to me. If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I am to read all 21 verses. But I'm not going to read all 21 verses. But within those 21 verses, my, uh, he mentions in verse 1 about a house, a building. Verse 2 and 3, being clothed. Verses 6 and 7, being absent or present with the Lord. Walk by faith, verse 7. The judgment seat of Christ, verse 10. The love of Christ, verse 14. A new creature, verse 17. Reconciliation, verse 18. Ambassadors, verses 20. And righteousness of God, verse 21. The verse we're going to look hard about is... Verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which lived should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Father, as we, ask, as we open up the word of God today and, and understand some things that's pertaining to us, let us just relax and receive what have you given us for today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's a great verse for the ministry. And if you think about it, once you are saved, I'm, I'm, I'm confident, confident that most of you heard a gospel today. Not only today, this weekend. If you have not, you have to trust Christ. Died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. You trust that. He saves you. He seals you. He justified. Then we have a work to accomplish. You just don't sit on your hands back there. Many of us have been sitting on our hands for a, a half our life. I remember, that, well, we'll get into this a little bit later. It's not just any type of work. It's a special work. Your members in particular, you're a peculiar people set aside for a, a, a great work. Brother Matt called me the other day. He said, how you doing, Special Ed? And I said, you're I said you guys are peculiar. I'm special. Okay, so uh, that's just it. And, but the thing is, we have a work to do. And the, and the thing is about we have a work in the dispensation of grace. Does the Bible not say in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that if, a man, if this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a what? Good work. And there's many Bible versions out there will change that word. And bishop's just an overseer. You oversee the church. We know there's a work to do in the ministry is very, very hard. Putting on a conference like this is not easy. And many of you know what it means to put on a conference. You messages you prepare, and the ministering is, goes on. But who do you do it for? Do you do it for fortune and fame? Do you do it to have 1,000 views on the YouTube channel? Do you do it to write books? Do you do it for, for yourself? No. What is motivating you? What is it good and to have so much to do that never seems to get done? You know, somebody asked me the other day, Ed, when are you going to retire? I said, retire from everything? Oh, you can't retire from preaching. That type of thing. I'm like, you can't? I'm like, apparently you can't. And listen, I treasure the elders that are above me right now. I miss the ones that are not here today. And Brother Morris uh, Chestnut out in Ridgefield, Ridge Farm, sends his regards and love. And there's many, many more that can't be here or, or you won't see for a while. And many have has done passed on. Uh, what is our motivation and drive that keeps us doing this good work? What is it? Verse 14, for the love of Christ. That's what keeps us going. It's not just any kind of love. It's not just the love that you and I have for each other, but it's Christ's love for us. And it, and it does not say love in Christ. 
It says what? Of Christ. You know what Romans chapter 3 verse 22 says? Even the righteousness of God, by, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, there is no difference. You know, the newer versions change that, uh, don't they? That one little word, of, uh, they change it to in. Do you think that's a big deal? Could you bump your head today and forget who you are? Is that possible? What do you call that? Amnesia. Is it possible that if you bump your head and forget who you are, you could forget who you ha have your righteousness in? That's why it's very, very important that it's of Jesus Christ. It's him. It's his love. And that's the same here in Corinthians, a book of reproof. We talked about Romans, a book of doctrine. We talked about Corinthians, a book of reproof. He's reproofing their behavior. And Christ is the issue, and we need to keep it that way. In the local church, a lot of issues will come up. People say, I don't like your coffee. Why don't you have tea? I want half and half. I don't like the way you comb your hair. All kinds of stuff. The meeting times are not right. You know, they, they, they one guy one time got mad because we didn't fellowship Monday through Saturday, and he didn't consider fellowshipping on Sunday it was fellowship. He gets mad. I had people get, get upset because I believe Paul did not write the book of Hebrews. I believe that the 12 are not in the body. And they just, get, uh, they just get upset. Well, if you don't believe that, we have no business here. I, and I'm like, stick around. This is, you know, stick around. You know, uh, people, people will pick at each other over and over. And you know what? They'll drag you in the middle of it. They'll drag you right in the middle of it. The issue should be the word of God, the Christ-centered love that he has for us. For the love of Christ constraineth us. You know what that definition is? If you don't, I'm going to get ready to tell you. To strain, to bind, in general sense, to press, to urge, to drive, to exert force. That constraint of love is the drive that keeps us going. It presses us into the doctrine. It presses us into sound doctrine. Paul just don't talk about doctrine. We know in times past that Moses had doctrine. Absolutely. Did the Lord Jesus Christ have doctrine? Yes, he did. Did John the Baptist have doctrine? What did they do the last two? Cut their head off and crucify. You know, that type of thing. It's sound doctrine, unmovable doctrine. In Romans chapter, be turning to Romans chapter 5. Less, Romans chapter 15, three, uh, 30 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Love of God, his love, not ours. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience, experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For sacredly for the righteous man will one die, but preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we, be, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And then not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received atonement. 
If you look down through there, because of the love of God is shed abroad. But God commended his love towards us. We were reconciled to God. We were saved by his Christ's life. We also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If that ain't love, then God didn't make little green apples. It don't rain in Indianapolis in the summertime. Many of you know that song. But this is the love of God. And, uh, did, but did you see in verses 3 through 5? And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, experience hope. Hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given. I'm going to take a few minutes. Many of you probably know what I'm going to say. I want you to think about this a minute. Tribulations, patience, experience, hope. You break it down in age groups. Tribulations, zero to 20. My hair don't look right. That boy don't like me. That girl don't like me. Then you got patience, 40 to 60. You start to settle down a little bit. You get married. You get a job. You start to do a little different things. Then experience 60 40 to 60 24 to 40 60 you're you're settled down with i don't know if, and then you uh then you have hope 60 to 80 i don't know if you notice a lot of people that 60 to 80 years old and especially in ministry that type of thing they're it's it's gonna be okay bud it's gonna be okay bro but 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 just settle down just let the word work in you that's our lives growing, and that's the way God wants us to grow through that process. Just take your time. I know people today, uh, we're kidless. Our youngest one just turned 29 a couple weeks ago, and uh, we're like, we're starting to live a little bit, starting to breathe a little bit. I know Ted and Sue, you call Ted up at 12.30 in the, uh, what's it? <laughs> Ted's in his pajamas, as Richard mentioned a couple weeks ago. He said, this is life of retirement. He said, you'll know that one day. I'm like, huh? I, I've settled on my mind that I was destined to work the rest of my life. You know, I, I know if you don't work, you don't eat. If you don't take care of your family, you're worse than infidel. Those, those words stuck to me. But you grow through this. That's the way God started. Go to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Talk about what the church to do, um, ministry-wise, individual-wise. Acts 14, God through Paul, Paul starts a local work in this. In Acts chapter 14, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel and to that city and had taught many they return again to Lystra and Acarnia and Antioch confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulations enter the kingdom of God and when they had ordained elders in every church and had prayed with fasting they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed you think there's tribulation in preaching? Tribulation. He preached the gospel. Here comes the experience, patience. He taught many. It takes time to teach. We was talking about kids this morning, and uh, Mike's littlest one's four years old, and he's got a long way to go <laughs> till he's released from that duty. And then we talked to Bill. Bill's at ten kids. And he homeschooled them all. It took a little patience, didn't it? It takes a little uh, tribulations, patience. He taught many. Experience coming. Confirming their souls and exhorting them. And then the hope was ordained the elders. That's a process of growing. And I, I, as I mentioned the other night, that a, a brother asked me, what's the purpose you want to see come out of this conference? The purpose is you take this word and you start the work. If you don't have a local work to get behind, you start a local work. 
If you need a ministry that we can hook you up to, talk to some of us. We'll help you. You know, we got ministries that are going all over the world now. And, and one of the ministries, you know, uh, that you could do is Grace School of Bible. I don't know if you ever thought of that, about that being a ministry. You always thought about a school, but it's also a ministry. They do wonderful work. And you don't have to worry about how they're spending their money. You just give it to them. And they'll, they'll get the word out. It's a process. I mentioned that uh, this year was our 15th year for Ohio Grace Ministries. I mentioned that Grace School of Bible hitting their 40th, or four, excuse me, four decades. Four decades. This year alone marks my wife and I was introduced to dispensational truths in the Pauline Doctrine 30 years ago. We was, we was in a Baptist church, and they was having to vote of confidence on their preacher, meaning I didn't know what that meant, but apparently he wasn't bringing money in with the people, and we just couldn't believe how people would do that. Now, Christians would never do stuff like that. And, and, and Sherry's cousin and another uh, man uh, was starting a Grace Church, and they was feeding us. So when we left the Baptist church, Sherry goes down there uh, with her cousins, I'm like, where's my wife going? What is she doing? Where's she? So I went down there and they started introducing me to this message. And before we left the church, we went back to Sunday school class at the Baptist church. And that was teaching through Acts. <coughs> Acts chapter 2. Ye men of Israel. Ye men of Judea. I'm like, isn't he talking to Israel? Isn't he talking to Israel? And they said, yes. And continue reading like it was no big deal. That opened her eyes, and that was 30-some years ago. And I'm very thankful that my wife is with me, okay? I'm very thankful. And I'm very thankful that she loves the Lord more than she loves me. Because she loves the Lord more than she loves me, guess what she's going to do to me? She's going to love me. Same as, same as I love the Lord more than she I love her. But I love her just as equal because I love her. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, the experiences that we had there, uh, I'll just share with you. There was three different men in Bristol. One of them was a, 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 new, a NIV guy. That one was a KJV guy. And the other one didn't really matter to him. And, and one of them was trying to start that church so fast, he was fire, he wanted to get everything organized quick. And they had three different views, and guess what? Three different outcomes. And we talk about unity, you talk about doctrine, you have to have that together, and you have to be on the same page. So that one guy left, and uh, we stayed there. And then the other guy started another work on the Tennessee side, which my wife and I went down to help him there. The other one stayed there, and then he let, he let um, these Acts 28ers in there. And I told the guy, her cousin at the time, we will stay here as long the doctor don't stay to change. And it wasn't much longer. He, he let a guy in there, and he said, here's Stan's books. Here's Richard's material. And starts throwing stuff in the floor. He says, you need to listen to this guy. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm over with. So we've been a part of church planning in that area. I think we helped plant three churches there or help them. Then we moved to Ohio. And the thing was in Ohio is to start a church was uh, the, the, was a core group of people, had a core group of people, and many of you may know their history, but we, we called 22,000 people within a 15-minute radius and asked you two questions. One, are you actively involved in the local church at this time? If you said yes, we said obviously uh, you have a church home, God bless. We didn't try to proselyte you. If you said no, we said, can we send you something? And we sent something for six, five weeks, sent them, you got material. 1,600 people said, mail me something. 700 people said they'll show up on the first, met, uh, first day. We're like, we're excited. 165 people showed up. But as the ministry continued, the doctrine was changing. And it was like Sifting sand through an hourglass. These are the days. Or no, anyway, going down through the hour, and it was no foundation. And it was about what the outcome of that was. 
He bought a building. He needed people. He said, Ed, all we need is 40 more people and this building be paid for. We committed two years, guys. We, commit, we moved our family not knowing anybody up here. We moved our family away from family because we exalted all of them. We was talking about selling insurance. What is the first thing you do when you sell stuff? You go to the family. The next thing they do, they run, don't they? Every time they say, oh gosh, don't talk, don't talk Bible, don't talk insurance, don't, you know. They run from you. So you go somewhere where you think you can help somebody. So we, when we came up, we committed two years, and then after that two years, we, you know, I went, I started grade school Bible in 2001. I did a first year in four months at 62 mile hour, <laughs> and uh, com finished it in three years. And in 2005, I desired the office of a, a bishop, and we started to work in the Massillon Canton area, and we're on our 18th year there. You know, many of you know we meet in a police dispatch station, and we're known as a little grace church under the law. And I always tell people, we're probably the safest church in America. You know, like I said, the glass is probably bulletproof. I don't know. But uh, anyway, we've we got some wonderful saints there, don't we, guys, that comes there and study the Word of God and, and, and all. But we all, over all those years, it's been tribulations. It's been patience. It's been experience. It's been hope. Because not only do you have saints of the most high God you're, you're building up through the faith, you have your own family you have to deal with. And they're going through tribulations and patience and experience and hope. Back to uh, 2 Corinthians. For the love of Christ constrains us. Why? Because we thus what? Judge. If the love of Christ, his love, constrains us, presses us, because we thus judge... In order to judge, we got to know some things, don't we? You just can't judge anybody just out of the blue. We, gotta, we should know what is just and what is right. Here comes the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Some of the things I'm sharing, you might have heard in messages in times past. But it's a constant reminder of the doctrine. This is when we first... We had seven years of dispensational truth under our belt before we even come to Ohio. And the guy we uh, started church with, he had some dispensational truths, but he couldn't control us in a way that he wanted to be our spiritual daddy, what he wanted to do, basically. And when you got that truth in you and you, and you grow it, you can judge some things. But this doctrine, the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that you get out of a book, the book that God wrote, it's very, very important. Philippians chapter, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. You know, I missed the men's meeting last, last month. And that's very, very important for the ministry. And I watched every bit of it. I was there watching you. And I listened to Richard's messages, teachings, um, twice. And this doctrine, this, it's, it, it needs to be brought forward. And you talked about standing. <clears throat> And you don't sit until the time needed. You stand now. You stand now. Just as the young, when you heard the gospel of your salvation, you heard that trumpet, you're in a ready state, you're, sta you're supposed to be standing for this truth right now. You don't waver. You stand. You don't sit down. You stand. You're ready at all times. Verse 9. And this I pray... And I appreciate that, Richard. I really do, because that's a constant reminder that we need to be who we are in Christ and stand. Because I look around this weekend, there's new faces here that I've never seen before. That's exciting. Because the brother's talking about he's getting older, 
I said, uh, he's getting old. I said, you're, you're getting old, but, we're, but some of us are getting older. So we're getting older in the message, and it's great to have people here that you know that you can trust and stand with and battle with. Verse 9, this and this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense to, till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which by, are by Christ Jesus Christ, and to the glory and praise of God. How do you approve things? You judge with wisdom. First Corinthians chapter two. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my, pre uh, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. I can hardly speak man's wisdom. Educated enough. But the thing is, you got God's wisdom. Man's wisdom is one thing. You know, we teach, I've been teaching grade school Bible at our local church since 2005. And we're going through Genesis study. And we'll, the things that I forgot. You know, what are you supposed to be towards God's word? Positive. Positive towards God's word. What about man? Negative. Positive towards God. Negative towards man. Positive towards God. What's man do? It's positive towards man negative towards God and if you realize what's going on out there in the world today and keep that in focus I tell people all the time you take the first three books of Genesis and the first three books of Romans and you can find out and understand why we are the way we are and when you can find out the way you are why we are the way we are you can understand where people's at you know I was sharing the other night about the guys I said do you know who Jesus Christ was is he said, yes. If he did not know who Jesus Christ was, where was us to go? Under a rock, Dianus? No. I go to God the Creator. You go back to Genesis and you work through and you explain what God is doing today. And, and once you understand mankind, and I heard, I heard the brother say up there, uh, Richard mentioned at the men's meeting, what he says, if you in the political world today, you know it's upside down. And if you could flip right now, if you go in there and flip everybody around and put it the way you are, you still have lost people there. You still have a lost world. You have to get people saved. You have to get them to come to the knowledge of the truth to make the difference in their life. And I guarantee you, you're sitting here today, you know that difference has made, this word has made a difference in your life and the decisions you make and the decisions your kids can make. Not with Tyson words of man's wisdom, but the demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of, of this world that, that come to naught, but we speak wisdom of God and a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for if they have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I brought that verse up to my sister one time. She said, what? I said, if the princes of this world had known, they would have crucified the Lord of glory. There's verses in there that seem like, what Bible version you read? You know, I've never seen that before, that type of thing. But that's 1 Corinthians, the wisdom of God. Where we find wisdom at? In the world, we find that wisdom in what? The word, in a mystery. The knowledge, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, did not cease for, to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, 
and increasing in the knowledge of God. Timothy talks about who would have how many men to be saved. All men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. I think you know that all men's not going to be saved. And you, and you know all men are not going to come knowledge is true. But does that mean you give up? You continue to press. You continue to move on. Understanding. Verse 7. Consider what I say. 2 Timothy 2, 7. says, Consider what I say, and the Lord giveth thee understanding in all things. I'm going to read some more verses right quick. Uh, Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 says for the love excuse me for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding how does God speak to us today through the wind through the red lights Lord if you're with me that red light will turn green when I get to <laughs> meanwhile you're breaking right slowing down oh he answered no it's through his word. It comes through the word of God rightly divided. He speaks. He spoke in times past. He speaks in but now. He's going to speak in ages to come. He's going to speak in ages to come. But right now we have his word. Also what is good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Judging with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. It will, it will change your world. And how you look at things. And how you don't look at things. And uh, you ever compared that with uh, gold, silver, and precious stones? Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 with me right quick. Verse 9. For the sake of time, verse 9 talks about uh, ye are God's building. Verse 10 talks about being a master builder, had laid the foundation. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Verse 11, for other foundations can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man built upon the, this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by far, and far shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If every man's work abide what which he hath built it thereof, thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. Now God said in Proverbs, be turning to Second Timothy. God said in Proverbs, receive my instructions and not silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. And he says, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold? And, and, and get understanding rather than chose, uh, uh, chosen than silver. The words and the doctrine is meaning something. It, it, it's wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And you compare that with gold, silver, and precious stones. And we know what gold, silver, and precious stones right now, you, you don't think that will burn. It will burn. The wisdom, knowledge, and understanding is the reward that we should strive for in the local church, in our self, and in a further in the heavenly program. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study thyself approve. Study to show thyself approve unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. You know, the brother said yesterday, reading, turn that TV off. Quit listening to those <coughs> other networks and read. That hits me right between the eyes. You know, Ted talked about Optimus. What's the other side of Optimus? Pessimist. I'm right in the middle. I'm a realist. And I'm not afraid to hit people in the eyes. And I realize maybe I shouldn't have done that. 
but just give me the glass and I'll fill it up or I'll pour it out, okay? I want to be straight faced with people. When you look at people, you have to be honest. They're, we're supposed to be adults. We're supposed to be able to handle some things. And the word will eat as doth a camper, canker of whom Hamias and Phidias, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection have pa is past already, overthrowing the faith of some. There's people today are throwing over, they will come and th overthrow throw the people that you're teaching and ministering to. And, and nevertheless, the foundation of God stand ashore, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one of them, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and of earth, so, uh, some to honor and some to dishonor. What do you think that honor would be? Gold and silver. If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified and meet for master's use and prepared unto every good work. I think it was around 1996, 97, we was at a big conference down in Tennessee and a brother talked this about the great house and purging yourself and he took it as if you need to purge yourself from that local church you're in and you need to separate yourself from that and go to your house and since then he did that and since then he no longer believes in King James Bible he's far out there in other doctrine and that's, that's here's another, something else I'm going to share with you I quit counting on my hands and feet how many people in the last 30 years that's ministered to me and I ministered with and stood on a pulpit with that no longer believes his message and you're like probably thinking, how can that be? How can they go back? You can. You start going after other doctors, if, what if, what if. And you start puffing yourself up with pride, you're going to put yourself on a pedestal, and you're going to start teaching everything they want to hear. And you will leave it. Now, I'm a, I'm the guy that brought us into ministry many years ago, in fact, he, he ordained us. I had six men to ordain me. Two of them were salesmen, and those two salesmen today are not with us. I had two of them are grace advisors. They're here. They're here today, and I had two military advisors. One gone on to glory, and the other one's uh, brother Ray Keeble. And I had those men. I had they're there for a particular reason, and they're there to groom, help groom me when I'm when I needed help. But two of the guys are no longer there. And I know I can appreciate they was there long enough to give me the gospel. But you're going to have to stand, guys. And it's going to hurt. It's going to be hard because you got family. And they don't understand those young minds are working. Then he says, you know, don't be a vessel of dishonor and ever learning and not able to come to knowledge of the truth but be that vessel of honor and knowledge. Don't puff yourself up, look what I know. You do it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him work through you. I'll be honest with you, I was a nervous wreck coming up here. I was back there pacing, sweating. My wife goes, let Christ in you do it. And I'm like, don't get me crying. <laughs> don't get me crying before I get up there. But that's the key, isn't it? Let Christ in you do it. Back to, back to uh, 2 Corinthians, and we'll get ready to close. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That wisdom and knowledge and understanding, I heard that years ago, and it's true. That's what we need. That's food. Somebody was talking about manna from David last night, wasn't it? Manna from heaven and all that stuff. This is food for the soul. This is good stuff. Verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one die for all, then we're all dead. Who was the one that died for us? Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus wasn't. 
We can identify ourselves with that. We can judge others based on that fact and the Lord's death. People tell you all the time, you can't judge me. You can't judge that. You know what you can judge? You can judge actions, but you can't judge that soul because that's God's doing. And you, all you can do is reiterate to them what God is doing, and you get that doctrine inside of you. Verse 15, and he that died for all, he, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him which died for them and rose again. Isn't that what we should be living for? Isn't that what we should be building our ministry on? Whether it's personal, local, or even for the body of Christ. You wonder what a church is to do? You live for the one that died for you. We told our kids long ago, don't please mom and dad. You'll never please mom and dad. But please the one who died for you. I wrote this poem many, 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 many years ago. It's called, I called it The Church. If I started a church for this generation, it would be by the doctrine of Paul's revelation. Consider, my friend, to what I have to say. There be no traditions of men to get in the way. There be there's no water baptism, but the Spirit is right. We'd walk by faith and not by sight. Now, when it comes to tithing, you'd be well pleased to give your share. It would come from your heart and not out of despair. The word would mean what it says and says what it means. We'd fellowship as one and no in-betweens. For Paul gives us guidelines without the law. From Romans to Philemon, it's well worth it all. With wisdom and knowledge, excuse me, for we are one body and we'll make a strong stand with wisdom and knowledge and understanding of his word in our hand. For when we, come, when we are together from now to evermore, we will rejoice to be complete in him, the risen, glorified Lord. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the things you've given us. And Lord, if there's one here today that truly don't understand where they're going to spend eternity, that you came to this earth and died and was buried and rose again for sins, let us believe that. Let them believe that. And we'll be together for eternity. Amen. Take you a little break and uh, we'll get back.